In this episode of Locked On Capitals, I talk with the Capitals Chur podcast. We talk about the Capitals season, what went right, what went wrong, and what can we expect next year from this Washington Capitals team. We'll talk about all of that and more next on this edition of Locked On Capitals. Locked On Capitals, your daily podcast on the Washington Capitals. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Well, hello and welcome into this edition of Locked On Capitals. I'm so glad you decided to join me today. As always, this podcast is free and available on all the major platforms. And I want to thank you for making this your first listen or view of the day. Yes, this podcast is also available on video form. So head on over to YouTube and check that out. My name is Dan Holmey. You can find me on Twitter. It's at DanCaps218. You can find the show on Twitter. It's at LockedOnCaps. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. In, in this edition, we are joined by the Caps Chirp Podcast. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. What's up? What's up? Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Glad you're here. So, guys, what did you think about this capital season? I know that obviously there's nothing, you know, to really positively take away from this other than to say that, you know, you saw some kind of great performances, some kind of flashes of greatness out there. But what were your thoughts on the capital series against the Panthers? I know it's been some time already, but kind of just a real buzzkill. This Capitals team cannot seem to make it past the first round of the playoffs. What are your thoughts on the Capitals? Paul, you want to go first? You'll probably be nicer than me. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I mean, you know, when I when I saw this team playing throughout the year, plus my preseason expectations, I thought there was a possibility they could make a run, but I thought it was highly unlikely. Um, you know, first of all, I'm glad they made the playoffs. I think they're too good to not make the playoffs. And then playing the Panthers, you know, we talked about this, you know, as the as we wrapped up. Um, a couple weeks ago, the uh, you know I went in not thinking we really had a chance to win the series, and then after a couple games, started to get some hope, and I think that made it sting a little bit more. Um, I'm probably taking some words out of Troll's mouth right now, um, yeah. but yeah, it was just it, it was uh, you know I think they put up a good effort. It was exciting, and uh, it, the most disappointing part was the inability to finish. You know, it looked like. After game three, you know, it looked like the Caps were in control. They were until midway through game four, and then they blew that 3 nothing lead, and then it was like the whole series shifted, and the Caps didn't have a chance once that happened. So, you know, I guess to, to sum it up, I, I think it wasn't a failure of a season, um, but they didn't necessarily exceed my expectations. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think that, you know, just to – Polly sometimes says it'd be better just to get swept. Right. Um, and I actually generally disagree with that, but I think in this season it would have been better to get swept because we, you know, we, the knife in the back is one thing, but twisting it uh, with the, with a couple overtime losses and then getting your arm ripped off and bludgeoned to death the rest of the way by, uh, you know, blowing a three goal lead with five unanswered goals is uh, pretty unacceptable. I, I think that sucks really bad. So, you know, and, and what's, you know, I don't know if you've, uh, I know we're recording a little bit uh, later on, on the East coast time on Monday, but if you think about it, <clears throat> uh, the Florida Panthers, sorry, that's my vacuum. Uh, the Florida Panthers just got swept by the Tampa Bay lightning. So, you know, now they're ripping their legs off and beating us with it. You know, I feel like that stings just uh, quite a bit more. Yeah, and just, you know, kind of a sweet feeling to me that the Florida Panthers lost, 
You know, they're the team that took down the Washington Capitals. And part of me is like, there's no way they're going to win the Stanley Cup. I knew that they had to go through Tampa. And Tampa is always a formidable opponent. And they've uh, shown that to be again this year. So it's going to be uh, interesting to see, you know, what transpires in the playoffs here. But it's it was a good feeling for me. I'm glad that the, you know, the Penguins are out. And I'm glad that uh, the the Tampa Bay Lightning are out. So at this point, I, I don't know. There's kind of a who is there a bandwagon team that you guys are following right now? Who are you pulling for? I know that I spoke with you, Polly, about this earlier. That you're an Avs fan, uh, hockey troll. What about you? What who is there a bandwagon team that you're following right now? You know what? I I think I'm hopping on the Avs bandwagon too. Um, I you know they've they've been so close the past few years, and they have to you know push through it at some point. That roster is incredibly deep uh in all positions i mean they are the tampa bay lightning of yesteryear uh the tampa bay lightning obviously seem to be still rolling um and you know we'll see we'll see what uh what what happens but uh i and i don't know who's going to come out of the east but i we were talking uh on the podcast last week that uh we thought that um you know the cup's going to go west this year yeah, and it's kind of a cool thing for uh, Burakovsky. Um, you know, I, he never really seemed to fit in with the Washington Capitals. I mean, there were moments that he was kind of a great goal scorer, but then he he's definitely, this was the best move uh, for him to go out to Colorado, in my opinion. But just to keep it back to the Capitals here, you know, the biggest question that that's looming out there right now is they didn't rectify, they didn't address the situation in net. It was uh, something that was staring them straight in the face, the net minding situation. You had Ilya Samsonov and Vitek Vanacek. We knew that this was going to be a, a, a big mess the entire season. That goes all the way back to my old pos- podcast that I was doing last summer, the goaltending situation. Why didn't Brian McClellan do anything to address this situation in net? And I know, you know, Mark andre Fleury, he didn't want to come here. He didn't want to go there. But when I was talking with J.J. Regan, one of the things he said is they should have picked up anybody and, you know, maybe they would have caught fire. I mean, you take a look at we had Craig Anderson last year and, you know, I mean, he was kind of questionable at best. But, I mean, couldn't they have used someone like a Craig Anderson this year, that steady hand in net, a guy that's like, okay, you rookies, I've been here. I've done that because you see what he did with Buffalo this year, too. He actually didn't play that bad. Uh, Polly, what were your thoughts? We'll start with, start with you here on the net minding situation. Why didn't they do something about it? Uh, Polly, uh, okay, yeah, I'm not uh, picking up on your mic here, so we're going to roll over to Hockey Troll here. Why didn't they do something to address the net minding situation? It was something that was there. We knew it. Everyone talked about it, and yet the trade li- deadline came and went, and they did nothing about it. What were your thoughts on it? Yeah, absolutely. You know what? I think that um, the the Caps were looking for an upgrade, and I definitely don't think that the market had that. Uh, Mark Andre Fleury, I don't think honestly uh, was an upgrade to either of our goaltenders. If, if I'm being, you know, if we're if we're looking at it on just paper, um, and I think that we would have had to ship a first round pick uh, to get Mark Andre Fleury uh, in any sort in any other really goaltender that in the in the market in the free agency this year, because uh, you know, like like I said, it was everybody was in high demand. The market wasn't there for it. Um, you know, I think that if there were some other, you know, if, I mean, you, you think back, like if Lundqvist, man, would have come back, uh, you know, that would have been, we, I think that even if he was quote unquote retired, I'm, I'm sure his phone would have been ringing uh, if he was still able to play. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't think that there was a true upgrade and McClellan came out and said, we're only going to do it if it makes sense, if it's an actual upgrade. And I had to agree with him. I didn't think that on paper there was a, a, a true clear better option or even a veteran better kind of maybe equivalent uh you knew you'd be paying dearly for it probably a prospect and a pick uh a high pick at that not that our picks are are super valuable but they're still a first rounder um so i just don't think it was there i also thought that you know i think that the caps are high on their if you look back at it since kolzig the 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 Caps have done a really good job of managing both their both goalies that they've had and drafting goalies incredibly well. 
Samsonov is the most recent uh, pickup here. I think that he was probably a, you know, I mean, I think that the Caps are still holding out a little hope on him. And I agree. I think that the the ceiling's high on him. Uh, he just needs to find some consistency and get a little bit better technically, which can, you know, can come through coaching, though I know that that has been uh, a, a target of ire amongst Caps fans here, the, the goalie coaching uh not having goalie whisperer Mitch Korn. So who knows uh, what the re reality was, but I just don't think that it was there. And I don't think that the Caps uh, were willing to mortgage too much of the so-called future. And I, I have to say, I, I'm proud of them for sticking to their guns. I, I don't I don't think that we needed a goalie uh, coming in. I mean, I think we needed one ultimately, but I'm not sure that we had the option. Right. Uh, Polly, what were your thoughts on that? Uh, was it? I was the only one that, I mean, I couldn't have been the only one out there that was a bit frustrated by it. I know that the Capitals were all in on Ilya Samsonov between him and Vitek Vanacek. The book on Ilya Samsonov, he's the better athlete. He's going to be the one that makes the more athletic saves, but he's also the netminder that allows soft goals. What were your thoughts on the netminding situation this past year? Well, I definitely favor um, <clears throat> VTech in the long term. I think he's more consistent. I think the reason that they didn't make a move is because they have two decent goalies at a good price. And, you know, like Troll was saying, unless it was like a very noticeable upgrade, I don't think they were going to spend the money. Um, I like them both. I don't think either one of them right now is good enough to be a one guy that carries you through the season. Um, I mean, I liked Craig Anderson. We, we took to taking him or uh, calling him old Craig, um, you know, and he did, he came in last year during the playoffs and he played pretty steady when we needed him. And I wouldn't have hated that as long as it was affordable. Um, but then you would have had to look at, are we going to get rid of one of these two guys who are making under a million bucks and send them to the AHL or trade them off? So I think it, it, it didn't seem like there was a whole lot of room to make the move even though I, I would have liked to seen someone else come in for sure. Yeah, because, I mean, they had him on the cheap. If memory serves, VTech was uh, for 750000 and uh, Ilya was two mil. So, I mean, that that's some bargain shopping, uh, you know, and that's some spending your money wisely, I guess. So, But now the question is, is that we know what we have in net. What changes do they need to make going into next year? So let's just take a look at Hershey. You have Zach Fukali which, you know, I think played pretty well for the, the Bears. He had those three shutouts. And for the most part, when he played for the Capitals, he played rather well. I think there was that one game he got kind of smoked out. But that can happen to any goalie. Uh, and then they also have Hunter Shepard and Phoenix Copley. Phoenix Copley, you know, that we've kind of been there, done that. We know what we have in Phoenix Copley. And he's not the Phoenix Copley of old, the one that was kind of a Braden Holtby's backup. So do you think the Capitals need to go outside of the organization or do you think that they should kind of, you know, stand pat with what they have in VTech and Ilya? I don't really think they're going to be able to keep both of them just because they're both RFAs. And uh, I don't think they're going to be able to afford both of them, to be honest with you. How do the Capitals proceed next year? Do they go out and get that veteran net netminder? If you look at him historically, even when Braden Holtby kind of rise to prominence, then they signed Thomas Volkun. That was always a head scratcher to me. You got to have Braden Holtby and you signed Thomas Volkun. Anyway, I reminisce here. What are your thoughts? Um, we'll start with you here, Hockey Troll. Next year, what do the Washington Capitals do in net? Do they just continue with the course as is? Yeah, and you know, I was over here saying like the Caps, were, I was proud of them for standing put in free agency. Uh, and I, I, I think that's, you know, I think they've made the right move there. But I do think that it is now a, um, I think that we've given these guys enough leash. Um, I think that we've shown uh, what they're worth. And since, you know, the off season's very long, uh, you never know who's going to become available uh, in, in the trade. Uh, so I definitely think that we'll probably only be able to retain one goalie. And I think it's probably Sam Sonov. I think VTech may find himself somewhere um, at a basement team, maybe starting, maybe backing up, doing, you know, the 50-50, uh, kind of like what he did here. Uh, I do think there's potential in Fucale. Not sure about Shepard. Um, he's another higher draft pick from what I remember. Uh, and, you know, the, like like I said, the Caps have been good at drafting goalies. So 
We'll see. Um, I, I, I'm out on Phoenix Copley. I think that he's going to probably, you know, fade away, walk into the sunset into the AHL, which is, you know, he's got had a good career, so good for him. Uh, but then you look at uh, you look at Fucale, who's clawed his way back after being a, uh, I believe, a number one overall pick or at least a first round pick with Montreal. Uh, it's taken that kid five, six years uh, from, you know, basically having the yips and being labeled a head case uh, all the way down to the ECHL is where he spent most of his time and has clawed his way back up into the AHL with a possible shot at making the team out of camp. Now, if Fucale makes the team out of camp, I mean, that does free up some cap, especially if they shift away from VTech and, you know, Kempney and um, Schultz are coming off the books this year. So there is a little bit of um, flexibility, but I think that what we're probably going to get is a goaltender that's older past his prime, uh, who has some playoff experience. That's I would I would be happy with that for maybe like 1.5 mil. Uh, you know, we we don't pay more than like 8 million for a goalie tandem. And I think that's good business, unfortunately, for the goaltenders. So I hope that trend continues. All right. So after the break, we are going to continue talking with the guys from the Caps Chirp podcast. Uh, some just some great talk conversation here. We're going to continue to to talk about the net minding situation. We're going to continue to talk about the defense. Yes, the defense. Everyone said, "Hey, Dan, it's not wasn't the goaltending; it was the defense." We'll talk about that after the break. Our partners at Bet Online continue to be the number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. Find all of the latest odds, news, and sports developments, including this year's basketball playoffs, Major League Baseball scores, fights, and even next season's NFL futures. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sports wagering information from live betting to playoffs, esports, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet Online, where the game starts. Thank you for making Locked On Capitals your first listen. For your next listen, check out Locked On Now podcasts, nightly recaps of every NHL game with analysis from our local experts. It's free and available wherever you get your podcasts. So, gentlemen, we're back here. We're talking about the net mining situation. And, you know, I don't mean to beat a dead horse here, but, uh, you know, that was the glaring deficiency on this team the entire season. So, Polly, what, what, what are your thoughts here? Do they have something in-house in your opinion, that they could go to right now, or should they just go outside of the organization? I think they need to go outside. Um, You know, I I think I had said this um, on our show. I would be comfortable with trading off both of them if we could get Gibson in return from (laughs) Anaheim. I'm not sure how much money he makes. But then if we could bring in someone like Gibson and then rely on the AHL guys to back up, I think that could be a pretty reasonable solution to the goaltending problem. I'm all about getting Shesterkin. What do you think? I mean, just let's kick some of these oh, these guys down the road and let's pick up Shesterkin. Um, because, you know, just to kind of pivot here a little bit away from that, defense. We, I mean, defense, I mean, giving blame where blame is due. Um, John Carlson had some kind of mistakes that he made out there. Um, it doesn't help that T.J. Oshie coughed up the puck, which led to a scoring play. So to say that is it is exclusively the netminders that's at fault would be a bit short-sighted. So just taking a look at the defense, um, Hockey Troll, you were talking about that, that Schultz is coming up on the end of his contract or his contract is done. I think that Schultz spent his last uh, game uh, with the Washington Capitals So the interesting question when we take a look at defense and, you know, many people have said, you know, like I said, it's not the goaltender, it's the defense. And to that, I say, so who comes out? John Carlson, Dimitri Orloff, Trevor Van Riemsdyk, uh, Faravari, uh, you know, who's coming out? I mean, I think that our defense overall is pretty good. We'll start with you here, Hockey Troll. Let's talk a little uh, Caps defense here. Was that the great deficiency? Was that the Achilles heel of this Washington Capitals team. Is that why the Washington Capitals are now setting up tea time instead of setting up round number two? So uh, that's a great question. And I think that, you know, you look at a defenseman like John Carlson, who sometimes plays 25 minutes a night, which, you know, is a ton of ice time. He makes uh, one or two mistakes after, uh, you know, 
24 minutes and 59 seconds of pretty damn good play and it's easy to point the finger i don't think that he's up to mike green blameability yet uh if you remember but i you know i could i could understand that uh i think it's um misguided though i i think john carlson is still a deal at eight million a year he's a top defenseman in the league those guys go for 10. i think we locked in cap uh i think we locked in cap certainty on him at the right time I don't think you're going to find a comparable or better for that wage. Um, so what I'm foreseeing is we let Kempney and Schultz walk and we fill the gap with um, Alexiev and, and Hershey or one of the young D guys, let them come up and see if they can make it out of camp and then reassess. And maybe we pick up like a TVR type player um, who is, who is, you know, kind of a stop gap, who's a serviceable, you know, bottom to, you know, middle to type guy uh, who can move up and down, pair with some people, maybe even kill some penalties. Uh, you can pick up those guys for pretty cheap, right? Uh, probably, you know, a few million, you know, a year, maybe a short term. I think that'd be okay. And then honestly, I think that we need to get a little younger and, and like one young, talented guy on the top six uh, in the forward core. I think one young winger would be, who's got a lot of potential, maybe like a right now, a 50 point guy scores 20 goals, got playmaking ability size, you know, kind of like a, a mantle light, I think uh, would help us close the door a little bit to apply that for checking pressure because the caps play a heavy game. You can see in the past few years, how that's, how that's worn them down in the playoffs. So for me, it's, it's, it's about getting smart, letting the young guys fill in the gaps. We, I mean, God knows we drafted so many defensemen in the past decade. Uh, let's give them a shot at the big club. We've got guys in the bottom six up front that we're comfortable with McMichael, you know, uh, Fialbi, Axel Johnson, you know, we've got guys that we can, we can slot in. I think the young guns really showed their, showed their medal uh, this season while everybody was injured. So let's get those guys in a little bit more of a regular rotation. And then one key, you know, not to say that, you know, obviously we've talked about several different things that have cascaded into maybe like a big dollar signing on free agency in the top six. And I think that that's really, that's how I would do it. You know, let's build from the net out, sure up the goaltending position, free up cap on the defensive end, let the young guys go. Um, so to answer your roundabout answer your question, I thought the defense was damn good this season. I thought, I think Jensen's coming to his own. I thought it was an incredibly sly move to hide Trevor Van Riensdyk from the Seattle Kraken uh, mm -hmm. during the whole taxi uh, season years in COVID. And then I think that, you know, our top six is pretty locked in. You have to have a really good player to come in and, and start move, bumping guys down. So the core is intact up front. So, Polly, that's the question for you. What defensive player moves out if we do pick up this big defenseman? You know, to uh, uh, Hockey Troll's point there, I mean, I don't think that we can totally throw John Carlson under the bus. I mean, I think that at the end of his career, he will be revered as one of the best Capitals defensemen of all time, in my opinion. Plus, he has some offensive upside. Uh, kind of similar to Mike Green in that regard. You know, Mike Green was able to score those great goals, but a little soft on the defense. So the question, Polly, to you is what defenseman comes out if we do if we do get another defenseman, I know that there is some people in Hershey, there's Lucas uh, Johansson, that kind of thing. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, you know, I, I agree with letting, um, it was Schultz and Kempney are both UFAs. Is that, was that why you said they're walking? Yeah. So I, I mean, I think we let them walk that opens up some space. Um, and I, I think we give the Hershey guys a shot. Um, I, I think the defense did have their, there were plenty of times where, um, <laughs> well, not to not to call him out here, but Troll was ready to blame Sam Samsonov for some goals, and I'd have to say, yeah, but look at the position the defense put him in. But I don't think it was necessarily the defense themselves as much as team defense where the forwards would break down as well. So, I mean, I, I don't think defense is an issue as much as just sticking to Lavillette's system. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think just – Roll, roll the Hershey guys. I mean, that's that's what I'm thinking. Keep rolling them in. See who can play. You get them in the preseason in October. See who's got it, and then go from there. 
Yeah, because I mean that's why they have the AHL and the ECHL and all that is for these guys to slowly work their way up in the system, and that's the one thing I'm kind of you know sick of the Capitals doing it and it's kind of kicking the can down the road. You know, one thing that kind of stands out to me is the Shattenkirk thing. Everyone was all hot, you know up on you know getting Shattenkirk and what what did we give up and how long did we have Shattenkirk for? And then I really hate to bring up this one too, just talking about trade deadline blunders, the Philip Forsberg thing. That is something. I think that will haunt this team and will haunt my dreams forever. Uh, I remember being at work and uh, seeing that tweet on my phone. And the first thing I remember thinking to myself, for one, who the hell is Martin Erat? I mean, I think I heard his name briefly. And then the guy that was kind of the diamond in the rough out of that deal was kind of not really revered as that big of a deal was Lada. If you remember that, he had uh, some decent years with the Capitals and became Tom Wilson's best bro, the, a bro, budding bro, bromance there. So, but in any event, just moving on from that is that I think that you're right. That's what the Washington Capitals have to do. They have to see what they have in house before they just start, you know, kicking the can down the road and moving this guy and trading this guy just to see what you have in house. All right. So after the break here, we are going to talk about the injuries to the Washington Capitals. Yes, there are three big names out there. How are the Capitals prepared to handle next season without them? We'll talk about that next. All right, welcome back. So now we're going to talk about some injuries facing the Washington Capitals. And I would say the most notable one, the most worrisome one, is Nick Backstrom, who had that hip injury. And uh, Nick uh, Backstrom was talking about it. He said that he might need rehabilitation, he might need another surgery, or, or he is thinking about possibly retiring after this. So can you guys picture a Washington Capitals team right now without Nick Backstrom. Alex Ovechkin's right-hand man, the one that, that, you know, dishes him the passes. I know it's Kuznetsov on the top line most, but you know what I'm saying. When that team is gelling well, it's always Backstrom and Ovechkin playing together. That's, you know, when the rubber meets the road, that is who they want scoring. It's Backstrom and Ovechkin. How worried are you guys about Nick Backstrom and the crazy idea that he might hang up the skates? Polly, we'll start with you on this one. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it's hard to imagine the Capitals without Nick Backstrom, especially if Ovechkin's still playing. Um, I think he, I mean, he's shown a little bit of age. I think his his injury definitely affected his play this year. Um, I mean, kudos to him for fighting through it, playing through it, because he still put up some, you know, he made nice plays, very clutch plays in the playoff series. Um, I think as long as he's willing to, to put up with the pain and work through it, we absolutely Absolutely want him back. I don't think getting rid of Nick Backstrom is something Capitals fans should even be putting out into the universe. Because I see way too much of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, him not on the team just feels wrong. And uh, yeah. it, it would really be a shame to see him retire. But obviously, you know, you got a life after hockey. So you got to think about that. Yeah. And that's the thing about it too, is, you know, I look at it and I think you guys look at it in selfish terms. And I'm speaking for myself. No, you can't retire. The Washington Capitals need you. Forget the fact that you're on the wrong side of 30 and that it's a long, you know, laborious rehabilitation. We need you back on the Capitol. So, I mean, ultimately, you know, just the hum humanitarian part of me, if he did it, I'd be like, you know, I get it. You made your money. You made your mark. You uh, accomplished all sorts of goals. But Hockey Troll, what are your thoughts on Nick Backstrom? I mean, part of me is a little bit freaked out. I mean, you know, this is a team in transition. And let's face it, there is a rebuild looming. I don't know if it's going to be this year or if they're going to need to make it to the first round and fall on their face again to have this rebuild. But if you take a look at the Washington Nationals, it can be ugly. It can be real ugly. You know, Juan Soto is the saving grace of the Nationals right now. They're in the cellar and they're like, Juan Soto, get us out of here. And then all of a sudden they're like, well, no, we actually might trade Juan Soto. I, <laughs> I, I hate to go on a side topic here, but what I'm talking about here is things can go bad when it comes to rebuild, but they don't have to. If you take a look at the New York Rangers, I mean, what did they have? One, one and a half bad years. And now they're in the playoffs playing rather well. So what are your thoughts on the Capitals future? Are, are, I mean, are they facing this big rebuild? And are, are you, how worried are you about Nick Backstrom? I am uh, very worried about Nick Backstrom. I mean, I think that he's uh, he was he just signed what he's got four four years left on that new that fresh freshly inked deal. Um, you know, I 
if and honest selfishly you know we're talking about being selfish for the players you know on on from their standpoint if i was nick backstrom i wouldn't want to retire either because if you retire you lose out on you know x 40 million dollars um i would rather like you know limp around and then go on ltir uh get that guaranteed money and just stay on LTIR for the next few years and just get paid while I, you know, I don't know, get fat. Um, I, I think uh, it, the, the hip thing is rough. He's, but if you think about it, this is, you know, usually with like hip reconstruction type surgeries in which he's kind of had a pretty in-depth one um, from the get go, they say, look, man, you're going to have to come back. Like this is a, this is a surgery that is temporary at best. And, for normal people, right? And then for normal people, it may survive 15 years, 20 years. But for a professional athlete, I mean, you know, five, seven years, uh, that's pretty, you know, you've got some mileage on that thing. You know, maybe it's just you'd open them up and swap some parts out, rehab it well. I definitely think he has the drive to do that. Um, and, you know, you have, again, like you said, uh, depends on the scar tissue around the area. And like, you know, if there's going to be uh, some, you know, if the doctors foresee some sort of nagging thing that's going to plague him for the rest of his life. So yeah, absolutely. It's, it has to take a lot into consideration. Um, by the way, I, Nick Backstrom seems like such a solid dude. I don't really think that he would just sit around, limp around and, and get on LTIR to, to take that 40 million, honestly. Uh, but at, at, at the same time, man, I wouldn't blame him for it. Um, so yeah, incredibly worried. You're right. There is a, there's a rebuild looming. The Caps core is in the twilight of their careers. I don't think that anybody, I don't think you can lie to yourself in that sense and, and say they're not. Uh, that being said, though, also to your point, I definitely think they've got a little bit left in the tank uh, to get in, you know, maybe a, a deep run again. Uh, Ovechkin still seems to be there, but, you know, obviously he's lost a step. I think Osh, while he's incredible, uh, you know, he's, he's, getting older too, Carlson. Yeah. I mean, the, the core is aging. So, uh, and, and we're drafting people, <laughs> but you know, who's who, you know, how many, how many studs are you going to get out of late draft picks that we've been getting? Um, so yes, I agree. The rebuilds there, but in, and, and to compare us to the New York Rangers, man, if the, if the caps can do that, uh, I have to have faith that they're going to be a competitive team through the rebuild, you know, maybe like a first round out, team playoff team maybe one year or two years that they miss that's kind of probably best case scenario in any rebuild but like you said the rangers man they've they've set the set the archetype for it and yeah they had to let go of some pretty um pretty vaunted players you know lundquist being one of them some heroes uh and i just i rue the day man i don't even want to think about it to be completely <laughs> honest yeah, it's kind of a surreal moment for me to think about. You know, I think there's a lot of nostalgia involved with the Washington Capitals because it wasn't just the 2018 season. There were so many highlights with Ovechkin and uh, Backstrom and just with a lot of the different Capitals players. But the next in injury I'm going to talk about is another one that worries me quite a bit, and it's Tom Wilson. It's his knee. Now, this one isn't quite as severe, and uh, Brian McClellan said that he should be back by the fall. But with that being said, I think that, that that series against the Panthers, I don't think the Capitals would have necessarily won the games uh, or they would have won the series, but I think that they may have won a couple more games if Tom Wilson was in there. Um, so I am a bit worried he has that knee injury, which, you know, when you saw it happen in real time, didn't look like it was that significant, but obviously it was because I kind of think of Tom Wilson as a tough guy out there. Not just a tough guy, a legitimate goal scorer. Shut up, NHL. 20-plus goals. Come on. <laughs> so... Uh, but how worried are you, Polly, about Tom Wilson? I mean, I, I think they missed his physicality out there, you know, and just kind of briefly going back to that Florida series, they got off on the wrong foot by missing that physical game. Everyone said that, you know, if you listen to in the beginning of the season, they said that this Washington Capitals team, look out, they're stacked. They got Mantha and Ovechkin and all these big frames out there. And they didn't really show up until like game three. And then all of a sudden Ovechkin was a bull in the China shop, throwing everyone around a little bit too much, a little bit too late. Polly, what are your thoughts about Tom Wilson and how concerned are you about him coming back next year? Well, I actually have a, a friend who's a, a Panthers fan and he messaged me after he got hurt and he said, I really don't think you guys can pull off the upset with Tom Wilson out of the lineup. So, I mean, that, that really just goes to show you what other people think about him, even if they don't like him. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think obviously it had to be pretty bad if he wasn't going to play through it because he is one tough guy. Um, 
it it worries me if you know he's not ready to go when they said he is because I think um, you know he's a he's a big part of this team. I think he's possibly the future captain, and he's definitely a big morale guy. He contributes literally in every category except playing goalie. Um, you would if you could. Yeah. Right. Um, and I, I think having having Tom Wilson healthy is you know in the the top priorities of this team. So you know hopefully they're they're correct on their prognosis on how his rehab goes and when he'll be back. But missing Tom would be very um, detrimental to this team, even if it was for a month or two at the beginning of the season. Yeah, I mean, all we can kind of do is cross our fingers and toes and hope that Tom Wilson comes back because, you know, that's what I've been banging that drum for Tom Wilson all year, that he's not this goon. He's not just that tough guy. I mean, take a look at his score sheet. Take a look at him versus Ryan Reeves, a true goon in the league. Uh, he only wishes he could get 20-plus goals. So then the other injury that I'm thinking about is the one to Carl Hagelin. You know, kind of that fluke accident at practice. He got a high stick, and it was a major injury to his eye. He said that he couldn't even see for a few days afterwards. Um, you know, this is one of the ones that's the humanitarian part of me. is like, forget hockey. The guy's got to see, you know, having your eye messed up, that is a big deal. Uh, he was kind of instrumental for, you know, with Hathaway uh, and Dowd on that line earlier in the season. So I think they missed him. They tried to plug and play Axel Janssen Fialbi in there, and then they had Jonas um, uh, or Larson in there. What are you, how concerned are you about Hagelin? Do you see him coming back to the Washington Capitals hockey troll? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, you know, that's a really good question. I, I don't know. Um, you know, Hagelin's got like one or two years left on a contract. That's pretty lucrative for a fourth liner. Um, I, and Polly and I, and I'm going to speak for Polly because I know what he's thinking. Uh, he, we love Carl Hagelin. I know that he was given a lot of crap this year for not scoring enough goals on his breakaways. The fact that a fourth liner is getting breakaways is, uh, you know, an oddity in itself. You should just be lucky that the puck's not in, in our zone. Um, I do believe that he was an asset to the team and a great penalty killer and was an awesome fourth line addition. Um, unfortunately, you look at guys who are playing that role in the NHL and they call them replacement level players for a reason. Now, I think that his his defensive side of the, of the game um, would be hard to replace, but not impossible for a budget player. And I think that's why we kind of brought in Larson and, and tested out Fialbi uh, in that position. So, you know, I think that the drop off won't be as severe um, if, if we have to kind of replace Carl Hagelin versus a Tom Wilson. Right. Um, so do I think he's going to play again? You know, I had a buddy who, who took a hockey stick to the eye um, and it, def you know, a pretty similar injury. Uh, he was bedridden for months because, you know, you can't move around or the blood pressure could pop like whatever healing sutures and, and some mini sutures, micro sutures that are in your eye or whatever um, may happen there. Uh, it's already been confirmed that Carl Hagelin won't have full vision returning, which really sucks. Um, he skated a little bit. So, you know, I could, I, I think that he'll try one more year. And if after camp, he's just like, I, I can't do it. I think he'll make the right decision and either retire or, you know, ask for a trade or something. I'm, I'm not sure though. You know, I mean, it's, it's really depending on how, how he heals up. Uh, let's just say I wouldn't be surprised if, if he does pack it in though, and I wouldn't blame him. Yeah. So that's another one. Just hope for the best. That's all we can really do. You know, scary situations around the capitals. So to wrap this all up here, Polly, I got a question for you. How worried are you about Peter Laviolette's job. You know, I know he's under contract, but Brian McClellan said something kind of cryptic. He said, we're going to keep his job, you know, that's going to be between management. Why wouldn't he have just come out and said his job is safe? What are your thoughts on Peter Laviolette? Is there any chance the Washington Capitals cut ties with him? Well, I mean, I, I think if his job was completely safe, they would have said that. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I mean... You know, Troll mentions all the time about how the average tenure of a hockey coach in the NHL is, uh, I think, two and a half years. And, you know, he's been fired plenty of times, always finds a new job. And it is such a trend in the NHL. If you don't get quick results, there isn't a whole lot of patience. It's, it's pretty rare to be Mike Sullivan or Jared Bednar and 
especially Jared Bednar, because he doesn't have a cup, whereas Sullivan does, you know, to get years and years with a team to, to really put in the time and, and build a program. I think if, if they see someone that's interested and someone available that they like, then they, they very well could get rid of him because while he has come in and, and they've performed well, they haven't really done what they thought Lobulette would do. And that's a quick cup appearance like he normally does. So um, I don't think I'd be surprised if they kept him, but I also wouldn't be surprised if they let him go because the game of hockey is so fickle when it comes to head coaches. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm sick of the coaching carousel. Speaking personally here, you know, the, the biggest thing, and I kind of went off on a tirade about it, was Barry Trotz. Uh, are you guys kidding me? A New York Islanders, you got rid of Barry Trotz for Lane Lambert. I mean, haven't we seen this movie before? We got rid of Barry Trotz, and we brought we had Todd Reardon. How, how well did that work? How, how about, you know, Adam Oates, that whole experience? Total madness as far as I'm concerned. Listen, guys, I could talk to you all night, and I would if they would allow me to. But before I go here, uh, Hockey Troll, why don't you give us a plug for your podcast? It's another great Capitals podcast. There are many great Washington Capitals podcasts out there. Let us know where we can find you and all any information you have for us. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for having us on, man. Uh, it was, it's been a really good time. Uh, you're definitely a lot more uh, formal and organized than we are. So if you're looking for a little bit of chaos, uh, check us out at Caps Chirp on Twitter. We're the official Caps Chirp podcast on the Hockey Podcast Network. Uh, and, you know, uh, you can find me at Hockey Trolling with an I in on Twitter and, and all social media. And uh, Polly, I'll, I'll kick it over to you and she can give them the handles, too. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks for having us on. This was good. Uh, love talking to other Caps fans because it doesn't happen often. You know, usually our guests are other teams from the network, um, which that's nice, too. But um, I'm at Cupcake Polly on Twitter, Instagram and TikTok. And uh, we're at Caps Chirp on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook and TikTok. So you can find us just about anywhere. And, you know, we put out you know, some news and we're not breaking news, but we're, we're sharing news and a lot of goofy content too. All right, Polly and hockey troll. Thank you for joining me. I'll have to do this again sometime. And once again, thank you uh, for joining me on this edition of locked on capitals. Now make your second listen locked on NHL from first round matchups to each Stanley cup kiss. Locked on NHL covers the playoffs like no other. Hear the latest news and opinions from our local experts every Monday through Friday. It's free and available wherever you get your podcasts. So once again, Polly and Hockey Troll from the uh, Caps Chirp podcast. Thank you for joining me and we'll talk to you again next time.